Memorial Day is Mother's Day, and I would like to bring out our student minister, Willie Muhammad, as he gives to us the lectures of words we need to hear. And I leave you as I came before you with the greeting words of peace of Ay Salaam Alaikum, <laughs> Brother Willie Muhammad. <laughs> really? <laughs> uh, in the most holy name of Allah who appeared to us in the person of Master Farah Muhammad, we thank Almighty God Allah for his coming, and we thank Almighty God Allah for his raising up in our midst the most honorable Elijah Muhammad. And we also thank him for leaving in our midst the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And in those names, I greet you all to greeting words of peace and paradise. I salam alaikum. I know you all have heard it all before, but I guess it doesn't hurt to say Happy Mother's Day uh, again, right? And, uh, but um, today, as it relates to, you know, it's regarded as Mother's, Mother's Day, and as Sister said, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan just tweeted out where he says that every day you ought to be honored as a mother. And I just want to, before I get into the main lecture of what we want to talk about, I want to uh, just share some words that the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan has said about the value of the mother. He said, one, he said this, next to God, there is nothing more sacred, more wonderful, or more powerful than a mother. Anything that interferes with your ability to mother properly is an enemy to God. As I reflect back on my life, I cannot think of any other person that I have heard ever speak about women in such terms outside of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. So when a man says that the mother is next to God, there's nothing more sacred. But when you look at that, you can see that we are raised in a world that does not view women like that. Even though that Mother's Day has been celebrated for years, they still, I guarantee you, you won't see a commercial or go and get a Hallmark card that say, next to God, there's nothing more sacred than the woman. Amen. Then he says, in addition, he says that anything that interferes with your ability to mother properly is an enemy to God. Then what about this world? How is it impacting the woman's, a woman's ability to mother properly because women now are being given the message that you don't really need to think about being a mother. They're getting the message to put their careers first before their actual families. And you're having some women who have done that and now in their later years they regret doing so. That they wish that they would have taken time off to begin to have a family. Right? But so you live in a world that God is upset at. This is one of the many reasons why God is angry at this world. Yeah. Because the enemy understands that if he, can in, if he can influence your ability to be a mother, he understands that he can further extend his world. Because in this Bible, it says it was through the womb of a woman that a person will be born who will destroy Satan. That's so he understand that there will come a time where through the wombs of women, they will give birth to messiahs. They will give birth to children who would have a desire to see Satan's world destroyed. But he has, in, he has gotten into that and say, you don't need to be a mother. And some women, even though they may give birth to a child physically, they still are not mothers. Because they just have the child, but they're not nurturing the child. Is that right? The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan went further to explain that women, what women need in order to become mothers, that the mothers that God wants them to become. He says this, next to God, the most magnificent creature is called mother. When you combine God and mother, you have a future. Without God, you can't, you can't possibly be the type of mother that you want to be. You need to be and must be. Mother and potential mother, when you, leave, when you leave here today, in this lecture he was saying, you will leave having a value for yourself. You are more valuable than you treat yourself, and it is not your fault. If you had a mother that instilled value in you, you were reflected, right? So even our mothers and their mothers have all been victims to this same satanic world, right? He goes further and he talks about how and we need a proper relationship to God. 
But then he talks about as men, there's something that we can do that can help them to be the mothers that they need. He talks about how with women that you also must have a certain knowledge. He says the word motherhood contains the word hood, which covers the head. So in order to be a good mother, a woman must have a covering for her head that would allow her to nurture her offspring. That which covers her head that allows her to nurture her child is knowledge. Any mother that does not have knowledge cannot be truly a good mother. She can have the love, she can have the love and care, but without knowledge, she cannot properly nurture her child. An ignorant woman is the heaviness of a nation. No woman should be allowed to be ignorant. For when you have an ignorant woman, you have an ignorant child and an ignorant nation. A woman must be made, women, all women must be made possessors of knowledge. Now you see in the Islamic world who they value the Holy Quran, but some of them say that women should not be educated. Right? So it shows you how Satan has made evil fair seeming, even though they make their prayers and they talk about the greatness of the prophet. But something is wrong in some of their practice that they want to deprive women out of knowledge. (laughs) So it says that you can't be a true mother without having knowledge. What knowledge? Not just what you learn on a college campus. The knowledge that you need or women need is the knowledge of themselves and the knowledge of God. Because when you have the knowledge of yourself and the knowledge of God, it puts you in a better position to properly nurture that which God allows to come through your womb. Mary was not an ignorant woman. When you read in the scriptures, when there were women who gave birth to children, they knew that God wanted them to deliver their children over to do his will. He goes further when he talks about the album of the Lord's Farrakhan. He says, there's a role that we as men must play. He says that heaven lies at the foot of the mother. This means that we must help in the production of a righteous woman. Talking about us as men. As men, we must know that the little girls that come in this world come in pure. And we as husbands, fathers and brothers and uncles and cousins must commit ourselves to protect the purity of the females that we come in contact with. He said, in particular, the fathers, the uncles, and the brothers. For oftentimes, it is family members that are destroying the virtue of young girls. So as men, we have to be like that biblical figure, Zechariah. Well, Zechariah was a protector of Mary. He made sure that she was protected We have to protect the women in our lives, but not only in our lives, because sometimes as males, we can say, I'm only going to be concerned about the well-being of my mother or my sister or my aunties or my nieces. But we have to extend that protection to those who are not our mothers, our biological mothers or biological nieces or sisters. And we also have to begin to start treating other women the way we want our mothers to be treated. So the album Minister Louis Farrakhan said that we should look at every woman the way we look at our mother. But Satan has created a world where some of us grow up and we have a negative view of the woman that birthed us. So something has to be done to repair that. So some people may say, man, I can't look at her like I look at my mother. My mother's not a low down woman. Well, that same value that we see in our mother is buried in those women that we see in the streets. Right? So as the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said, he said, there's no such thing as a no good woman. She's been made that way by a no good man. And when people hear that, I've told brothers that they've gotten upset. Because they're thinking about how the women that they didn't hurt. But they don't understand that a no good man could be the father in her life that sexually violated her. Or the uncle or the cousin or the nephew or the older brother. But when we have this knowledge, it is on us to begin to start understanding that and begin to start helping them to repair themselves. So today we're going to have a special message, a Mother's Day's message. And the message is titled, as you see the clip going flashing on and off, it's titled, Who can help the widow and her son? And the idea behind this lecture 
came from what I saw on CNN and other news stations and on the websites. Where if you were watching the news several weeks ago, you saw the mother who was slapping her son because he was out involved in the protest and the uprising that took place in Baltimore. And they're flashing it more and more. Every You watch the news today on CNN, you're going to end up seeing it, right? And when you get the opportunity, brothers and sisters, make sure you go into our bookstore and make sure you pick up this edition of the Final Call newspaper. When you see the brothers or you uh, offer the opportunity to make a donation to get this paper, go ahead and get it. So today, not only get one for you, but get several for even your family members because they need to read this. Because in this paper, it talks about national headlines, but it also gives it from a perspective that's beneficial to us as black people. Yes, because it lets you read it, but it tells you how this affects you as a black man or a black woman right. or a black child. Is that right? Yes, sir. There are some points in this article that are very key. In one of the articles, it talks about how our sister, the Baltimore District Attorney Marilyn Mosby, how they said that she didn't pass the buck. When it came time, when the files were given to her, she had to make a decision, would she charge these police or not? She didn't do what, like other district attorneys do when they have to decide whether they're going to charge a police. They pass it. They pass it to the grand juror. They say they're going to pass it to the federal prosecutors. That happened here in New Orleans. Not too, long, not too far from here on Diamond Road, Danziger Bridge, after Hurricane Katrina, the police shot up a family and a mentally handicapped man. The mentally handicapped man and his brother were trying to get over to their brother's dentist's office. But the police shot him in the back. And then when the people came back, when they came back after shooting him in the back, they came back and shot him again to make sure that he was dead. They shot the family up so bad it killed one of the teenage sons and the mother's arm had to be removed. And her pastor said that when he came to the hospital, when he said, what happened to you? She said, Reverend, there was the police. And he said, oh, come on now, I know the police didn't do you all this. As a pastor, he said he couldn't fathom that the police would shoot a family. But then when the information came out, someone had videotape of them shooting on the bridge. And it was the New Orleans, members of the New Orleans Police Department. But when it came time for the DA to charge them, he stepped back and said, well, I'm going to let the federal prosecutors, make the federal government make that decision. So they made that decision and began to start exposing what took place. But even though they were charged, and when they were charged, and many of them, they were found, they were convicted, now you're having the judges starting to overthrow those convictions. Well, they may end up beating those charges. But when it came to this sister, she's only 35, she didn't back down. She didn't pass the buck. But she also did something else that was highly significant. She charged them with something that many people don't charge police with. She charged them with false imprisonment. False imprisonment means that I'm going to charge you for arresting these young, this man. And you arrested him for something that he didn't even, that was not even illegal. They were talking about their arresting him because he had a pocket knife. But in Maryland or in Baltimore, they're saying, she's saying that that pocket knife that he had was not illegal. Do you know how many black men get arrested and they are arrested and they are found innocent or the charges are dismissed, but that arrest is still on their record? And when they go to fill out a job application, they have to put that they were arrested. And some, job, some employers, when they see that, they stop and just throw it away. I know a young man who was the SGA president of Southern University here in New Orleans. And I saw him two weeks ago. And I asked him, man, what's going on? He just had to take off from work and drive to Baton Rouge to try to get a arrest where he was falsely arrested, removed from his record because it's impacting him to, from getting the type of job that he wants. If she is successful for, in this effort, then other people are going to start saying, we want you to charge them with false imprisonment. Yeah. imprisonment. 
because they are arresting black men for frivolous things. They beat you up. And you move and you're trying to resist them punching you in the face and they charge you with a resisting arrest and assaulting a police officer. Right? Then in this, in this paper as well, remember when the riots or the, the uprising first started, they started saying that the people who were behind the uprising in Baltimore were the gangs. And they said that the gangs had formed a truce and said that they were going to start attacking the police. But then the gangs came out and they began to start pressuring the news reporters saying, no, you all have to talk to us. We did not form a truce to attack police. We never said that. So they were lying for a specific reason because they wanted those police to begin to have a justified excuse to do what they want to do. I was watching this documentary yesterday called The Spies of Mississippi. It's about an hour long, 53 minutes. And they were talking about how in the early 1900s, 1910, 1920s, the Klan had begun to start going down in its, in its population, in its membership. Then during the 60s, they began to start seeing an increase in the membership, the 60s, the 50s, the 40s. But then they said that nearly in Mississippi, they noticed a trend that many of the Klan members began to start em trying to get employment as police officers. And they said they believed that at least 50% of the Mississippi police in this particular parish or this county were Klan members. In the message to the black man, a Klan member wrote to Moses Amir Elijah Muhammad and told him, that we are going to change our robes. We, he said, we, one day we won't wear our white robes. We'll now begin to start wearing blue uniforms and black, black robes. Thurgood Marshall, before he retired, said that now he realized that the Klan have given up their white robes and now they wear black robes. So you see these police officers who are now studying mixed martial arts. If you go back and watch when they arrested Freddie Gray, the brother who had the video camera said, man, y'all bending him up like he's a pretzel. So they know how to put you in these little moves that from the eye, it doesn't look painful, but it's putting intense stress on your bones. Breaking him up, is that right? So in this article, the gangs talk about how, what made them decide. They say that they had the truce. Ease them. They, made the, they made the decision to do the truce the day before the uprising even took place. They don't tell you how it was these street organizations that were out there trying to get these brothers to stop damaging certain businesses in the community. But if we just rely on CNN and Fox News and MSBC and all of the other ones, we will never get the truth. So it is very beneficial to all of us that you get this Final Call newspaper and you read it. Now you're starting to see the FOP, the Fraternal Auto Police, who once backed Marilyn Mosley, the, the DA in Baltimore. They contributed to her campaign. Now they're starting to question her ability to be able to handle this case. They're saying it's a conflict of interest because she did something that many DAs run from, charge law enforcement. You got to realize that all throughout the year, the DA and the law enforcement are working together against criminals. They form relationships. They have buddy-buddy relationships developed. Now they have to make a decision to charge the same people who at one time they used as key witnesses against criminals. So she charged them, so now they're attacking her. And if you, st you study history, the same thing that they did to district, uh, district attorney, the first black district attorney in the city of New Orleans, D.A. Eddie Jordan, they're about to do it to her. Right. Remember D.A. Eddie Jordan, he had the guts to charge those police with murder, yes. first degree murder. Yes. And when they got ready to turn themselves in, all of the police, it was hundreds of police that were out. That's right. And these police were out cheering them on That's right. when they were turning themselves in, calling themselves heroes. And anybody who said anything against that was, was, was frowned upon. Right. 
We were in some meetings here in the city. There was a, a, one of the top black defense attorneys. In the meeting, he said that on an unofficial police website called Signal 26, www.signal26.com, he said on the website, they had a picture of district attorney Eddie Jordan, and over the picture, there was a caption that said, the city's number one rat. Now, these are police officers right. referring to the top law enforcement agent in the city as a rat. Right? And if you remember after that, Brother Vincent is a byproduct, a situation that he was involved in came out as a result of them trying to discredit D.A. Eddie Jordan. After Hurricane Katrina, Brother Vincent and some of the other brothers were still here in the city. They were at the gas station at Chevron on LGS where they were encountered by police officers. And I'll make a long story short. One of the police officers took the gun out to shoot one of the brothers Brother Vincent was with. Right. Brother Vincent grabbed the gun and a struggle ensued. A police officer came out of the gas station shooting and the bullet struck Brother Vincent in the arm and went through his shoulder and it struck the police in the head. Right. And then they were arrested. But in the city, there was this law that said if you were not charged by the district attorney for 60 days, you could be released. So Brother Vincent and the brother, they were released, free, no charges. But when Eddie Jordan charged the police officers, what they began to start doing, the police and others who were a part of them, they began to start analyzing every case that district attorney Eddie Jordan handled. So they released to their friends in the media. They said, while Eddie Jordan is charging police officers as killers, he's letting people who shoot police go. And as a result of that, they, they, they opened back up the case involving Brother Vincent and, and, and other brothers, and they said they wanted them to try them again. They had to turn themselves in. But they only did that. They only looked into those cases again because of what Eddie Jordan had did. And that didn't stop after that, all praises due to Allah. It didn't stop with Eddie Jordan after that. Then they began to start looking at the group of people that he brought in when he became district attorney. They said that he fired all of the whites and hired all of the blacks. Now you have to remember that he came into office replacing Harry Connick, one of the most racist district attorneys, who over the last Three years, at least about four or five black men have been found that they served jet time in prison for a crime that they didn't commit because of the wicked practices that took place under uh, Harry Connick Sr.'s office. Then what took place, do you know when one of the brothers got out of jail, he sued the city of New Orleans for $14 million? And he won the case, and they took it to the Supreme Court, and it was a Negro on the Supreme Court? Clarence Thomas, who said that he didn't see any history or pattern of racial discrimination and corrupt practices in Harry Connick's office. But when investigators who studied the cases of Harry Connick, they said like out of two, they said out of one out of every three or two out of every three cases, convictions had some misconduct going on. But now Eddie Jordan was charged with, he was sued with re uh, reverse racism. And he would file a lawsuit and basically he ended his career here in the city in shame. That's right. But it was all because he had the guts to stand up for justice and charge police as killers. Yes, sir. Right? So as I watched that, as I watched and I thought about this, when I, as I watched the constant shows and TV programs and news reports about the sister, and they showed her slapping her son. I thought about all black women, especially these black women who are single and struggling to raise their, their young male sons by themselves. Some of them doing the best that they can. Some of them doing an excellent job. Is that right? Then I reflected on those mothers who have lost sons in the last couple of years. You think about it. When you saw Trayvon Martin, his, his case when it was in the news media, who did you see on the news the most? His mother. The person that they talked to the most was his mother, right? Then when you see also Mike Brown, who did you see the most? 
his mother. When you saw Eric Garner, his wife was out there, right? Even Marilyn Mosby, she is a product where her mother pretty much raised her, and she said that her daddy was in and out of her life. So you have all of this pattern of black women raising children by themselves. Black women shouldering, shouldering this responsibility pretty much by themselves, right? So when you look at the sister, her name is Toya Gregam, the sister from Baltimore. As I watched that, I could tell that the spirit in which that sister acted out of was out of a sincere love and desire for the protection of her son. That's what she was out there for. She wanted to protect her son, right? But as you have to look at, as the album Minister Louis Farrakhan reminds us this, he said we must remember that the media is not our friend. Because now they're beginning to bestow this title on sister. She's the mom of the year. Right? You've heard that? She's the mom of the year, right? But what they are doing is they are using her actions. Despite her actions coming out of sincere desire to protect her son, they are using it to support and continue to put on white supremacy. And I'm going to explain what I mean. The, in a white supremacist society, they do not want to see black men stand up, right? right. They do not want to see black men stand up. So the message, did, even though this was not the message in her mind, because she told us, son, if you're going to do it, take the mask off. If you, you want to participate in something, why are you hiding your face? But see, they were using that to let other mothers know, we want you to tell your son, don't get involved in uprisings like this. Make it peaceful. And you have to understand that in this society, they want to have it where black men are docile. Right? When you listen to her son on an interview, they say, why were you there? He said, I wanted to go there because of all of my friends who were injured or even killed because of the police. So I saw myself honoring them. Right? But this world loves non-threatening black men. So this is why in the national scene, when you watch the news, you, very, you find very few dark-skinned black newscasters. Most of them, if you don't know, they can pass for white. Right? They're very light skinned. And if they're all men, chances are they're homosexual. Right? Why is that? And they've done studies to show where they've done studies to show that how they're saying when you put a black man or even a black woman on the news or in television, make them light skinned. Get somebody that looks, that kind of reminds us of ourselves. People have done studies on this. So when you see it, the message that they're saying is, don't give anything that will encourage that type of behavior in these young men. Because if that continues to be encouraged, we won't be able to stop them. Remember when, they, when you saw the early gangs in Chicago, when the Jeff Fords and the uh, Larry Hoovers, these brothers were in their teenage years and they had followers in the thousands. They had young brothers following them when they were teenagers. So it sees that leadership potential in them. So the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said this about the youth. He said, black youth, he said, you're the strongest and most powerful generation we have ever produced since our fathers were brought to the shores as slaves. He says, black youth. You are the finest generation we have ever had because you are the finest generation. That is, that is why you are under attack. Because of that potential. Yes. They see that the generation that we have, that they have the courage of David. They're not afraid to challenge the Goliath of today. Yes. And they're challenging the Goliath of today without corner weapons. Anything that this society pretty much says you should do, they say we doing opposite. You see them in the schools, you say, I'm going to call your mother. I don't care. I'm going to send you to the office. So what? You won't be able to take the leap test. I don't care. You want to fail the class. I don't care. And when you talk to people, they're like, this generation just doesn't care. But even though they have the spirit and the courage of David, they're blind like Samson. 
So therefore, that courage and that spirit is not being used in a constructive manner, but more of a destructive manner, in a self-destructive manner. Is that right? Yes, sir. Now look at the mode of, to show you the, the motive of the media. Now this sister who's the mother of this brother, she's a mother of six and she's unemployed. And in the interviews I watched, no one never asked about the father, right? Normally, in this society, when there's a black woman with numerous children and unemployed, they talk about her being a welfare queen, right? They didn't mention anything about that. Normally, when they don't mention, they will say, yeah, she did this, but she's the mother of six. Where's the husband? How does she, how does she provide for herself? None of that was mentioned. She was invited on all of these shows. Even Oprah Winfrey took the time out to call her and thank her, right? So when you look at this, the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said that how sometimes we can be participants in a conspiracy and not even know it. And I'm not saying that she, I'm not saying that that's her motive, but in her sincerity, she was trying to save her son, but then you have Satan, and Satan has a greater motive. I'm going to use her sincerity, but I'm going to use it to put out a message that benefits my message. Because in a different context, if she was just saw, say, for example, Freddie Gray never died. It never happened. If she was seen on TV beating her son, what would they have said about her? But in this time, it was okay because it benefits our agenda. Right? So then when they came into this thing, they started talking about how we are destroying our own community. See, that's a diversionary tactic. Because if they were really concerned about our community, there would never have been such a thing called white flight. Where they left when integration took place, when we moved into their schools, moved into their neighborhoods, they left. And when they left, so left the economy and the tax dollars. I was in a meeting and they were explaining the way that Eastern New Orleans became populated with black folks is because when we moved into the central city where white folks were and moved into the projects where were originally housed war veterans who were white who came back after the war, white folks moved to Eastern New Orleans. And then we want to follow them, we moved to Eastern New Orleans. But then they say, you know them black folks don't like to swim, we going across this lake. And we didn't go across the lake, so those black folks with me said, now we're not going to follow you over there. <laughs> but now we're getting a little bit more money, and we're moving over there, but now they're moving where? Back in the city. Right? So don't get caught up in them talking about they're destroying the community. Because the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan says that injustice, had, it brings about its own consequence. And he said that when a human being is deprived of injustice, the balance of justice in their mind begins to be imbalanced. And he said when people's minds are imbalanced, they fall into stages of insanity. Think about when you were upset. And Sister Phyllis, we were talking and she brought this up. I thought it was very interesting. She said that there are some times when she was upset and she destroyed things in her own home. Don't raise your hand. You know you're in the, you know you get it, you're upset at your husband, you upset at your wife, you breaking dishes, punching holes in, and it doesn't make any sense, but your anger has caused you to do something that's really ir destroy your own. And if you go back and look in the story of Samson, Samson was so enraged at his enemies that in his effort to destroy them, he killed himself. So you see those young brothers and those young sisters, they, got, they have the rage, but they don't have the guidance. They don't have the training, and then they don't have a proper understanding of who their enemy is. They're just upset, and they know that they need to do something. But God, without guidance, you begin to do something that's self-destructive. Is that right? Some people say, well, why didn't they go in white neighborhoods? Imagine if that took place in New Orleans. How far would we have to travel to get to them real wealthy white neighborhoods? If you're trying to get to Lakeview, you got to walk through the over the high interstate, right? So they're not going that far because even in our madness, you cannot remember, you cannot forget that we are still victims of white supremacy. I grew up in New in, in uptown New Orleans. There were brothers who were known as killers and robbers. 
who will open up a gun. I remember a guy rolled up. It must have been 50 people out in the neighborhood listening to music. He rolled up and shot a dude in front of everybody like nobody was there and got and walked to his car and rolled off. And he think he was hiding the next day. He was back on the corner the next day. Well, they didn't have any problem in shooting or robbing. They would rob somebody that they were just on the corner selling dope with. But they never, very few of them, went across magazine and robbed them white folks in Irish Channel. In fact, some of them will say, man, don't leave them white folks along over there. They will say this, stop doing that because you're going to make it hot on us. All that was just a way of supporting white supremacy. You don't mess with white folks, you destroy your own kind. So us in our anger, we know we may be mad, but we're not going to go destroy their stuff. Because we still are in the slave mentality. Is that right? Yes, sir. So they called them thugs because they were burning stuff up. And the sister's husband is a council person in Baltimore. And when they were interviewing him, the man was like, thugs. He said, well, why don't you call the people in Kentucky thugs when they won the championship? And they begin to burn and flip over cars. They tear stuff up, too. But when they tear it up, when they do something out of line, they say, oh, he, was, he, was a, he had mental issues, right? Then they want to start talking about how his upbringing, his mother, his relationship with his mother was not the best. But when it comes to us, we can't use that excuse. There was a, I think this young white boy in Texas, he was driving drunk and killed somebody in the car, and they said because he grew up in a wealthy family, that's what led him to do it. So they used his wealth as a justification for him to beat a crime, but why can't we use our growing up in a poverty-stricken environment? Why can't we use growing up where we are taught self-hatred to love ourselves and to hate ourselves and love others as a justification for what we do? So don't get caught up in that. And then they start talking about riots. But Dr. King, who they love to quote so much, said that a riot is only the voice of the oppressed. He said a riot is the language of those who are being oppressed. Yes. But they don't bring that up, right? So now they're talking about the children were rioting because they need more programs. They need this. No, they were rioting because they were tired of seeing police officers kill their own. That's the problem, right? You know, as I reflected on the video of the sister, I thought about the Willie Lynch letter. And in the Willie Lynch letter, it talks about the making of a slave. It says that he says the following about how if you, he says, if you focus on the black woman and if you focus on the black woman, he talks about how it would have an impact on her mind and the way she rears her children. Can I read this to you all? He says, take the female and run a series of tests on her to see if she will submit to your desires willingly. Test her in every way because she is the most important factor for good economics. If she shows any sign of resistance in submitting completely to your will, do not hesitate to use the bully whip to extract that last bit of resistance out of her. He doesn't use the word resistance, he used the B word. He said, take care not to kill her, for in doing so, you spoil your good ec economics. When in complete submission, she will train her offspring in the early years to submit to the labor when they become of age. Now he says that's the process of how. Then he says this is the impact of the child rearing. And I know some people are debating whether or not Willie Lynch was a real person. Even if he wasn't a real person, there are enough slave narrative to show that this type of practice actually went on. He says this, we have reversed the relationship. In her natural uncivilized state, she would have a strong dependency on the uncivilized nigger male, and she would have a limited protected tendency toward her independent male offspring. So he said in her natural state, she will grow up basically with a healthy respect and regard for the male. And she will let her son grow up to display masculine and independent uh, behavior. But he says that we reverse that to such a degree. Now, he says, she will raise her male offspring to be dependent like her. Then he says, nature had provided for this type of balance. 
He is a man that says that they have the ability to affect the nature, the natural way that God made human beings to function. He goes further. We reverse nature by burning and pulling a civilized nigger apart and bull whipping the other to the point of death in all in the in all in her presence. So he uses fear and terror to make a woman not raise and nurture her children or do raise her children in a natural way, right? He says by being left alone unprotected with the male image destroyed, the ordeal caused her to remove Cause her to move from her uh, psychologically dependent state to a frozen independent state. Basically, he's saying that after a period of doing this, now she begins to not so much look to be dependent upon a man. And it's not saying that she just need a man to do everything, but basically having this healthy regard, basically seeing man as God wants woman to see man, right? He says, now we've gotten her in a frozen state and an independent state. He says, in this frozen psychological state of independence, she will raise her male and female offspring in reverse roles. Wow. For fear of the young male's life, she will psychologically train him to be mentally weak and dependent, but physically strong. Now, that's the practice that we have been in. He goes further, because she has become psychologically independent, she will train her female offspring to be psychologically independent. What have you got? You've got a nigga woman out front and a nigga, the nigga man behind and scared. Right? So in the school system where I have witnessed, I've seen because mothers know how deadly these streets are. And out of their fear of having their son or getting a phone call about their son being shot down or their son getting in trouble, some of them overcompensate and spoil their sons. Well, he may not be doing well in school, but she still gives him the nice shoes, still gives him the video game because in her mind, she's trying to protect him. And so some of these young brothers, they know that and they play on their mama fears and say, you don't have to give me the shoes. I'm going to go out in the street and get it like my cousins and them do. Right? So then what begins to start happening is begins to, they be, that, that natural side of development in the young male child, it begins to be hindered. Where she ends up raising a male to be the type of man that even she doesn't like. Well, at 40, 45 years old, he's still depending on his mother. He's still like the movie Baby Boy. Even though he's gangster and all this, he's a baby boy. Still afraid to get out of the nest and do what God has placed in him to do for our community. Right? So when you see this, the album Minister Louis Farrakhan, when he brought members of the black Lives Matter movement to Chicago and he met with them. Somebody sent me a, uh, somebody let me, a, allowed me to see the notes from that talk. And the album Mr. Louis Farrakhan mentioned, I had noticed it as well. I said, man, many of the activists leading the Black Lives Move Matter, Black, black Lives Matter movement are sisters. Right. Many of them are sisters. Right. And the minister said, that's not a bad thing, that's a good thing. He said, even if it is sisters, their leadership should be supported. Right. He said, however, it's bad the fact that they are taking the front lines against an issue that affects us the most as black men, police brutality. Right? right. So you're seeing this. If you have the opportunity to work in the school system, most of the students who are not afraid to speak up, most of the time it's the female students who are raise their hand and say what's on their mind. Most of the brothers have been made to believe that it's just cool to be ignorant and not show your intelligence. Right? Let them do it. But what does that do for us? Then with that type of training, we grow up in an environment where you are awarded and rewarded and praised as a young man to live off of a work of a woman. Amen. Now it's pimps. And do you know that they say in the, ma in the mafia that one of the professions that they hate the most are pimps? Because they say that they cannot respect a man who makes his living off of a woman. But we grew up in a society where we are taught to idolize pimps. 
Have you ever seen a movie that had a white pimp in it? You ever saw one like that, and it was on the level to the movies we've seen with pimps? I know they talk about Iceberg Slim. He was supposed to be white, one of them. White chocolate, I don't know what his name is. There's a brother here in the city. He said that at the age of 13, he was considered by his school to be a genius. He was gifted. And he said that one day he snuck away from his mother to go to the movies downtown to see a double feature. And the double feature at the, at the dollar show was the Mac and Superfly. He said that he went into the movie theater, an honor roll student, and he said he left out wanting to be a Mac, wanting to be the Mac, and wanting to be Superfly. And he said after seeing that movie, his life spiraled out of control. Where he went to where he was shot, sold drugs, committed robberies and other stuff, to he was on drugs. All because of an image that he saw in the movie, right? Think about that. But look at the images that are being promoted to us. So the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan in the lecture, he pointed out, and I thought it was interesting, he said, he asked the question, have you ever noticed that in the Bible that many of there are a large number of women who are found by themselves raising male sons? Right. And he said, why do you think that is so? And he began to start explaining, it, explaining why it is so. When you look at Moses, you don't read about Moses' father. Right? You read about Hagar when she was running back and forth in the wilderness by herself. And they say Jesus, they say that he didn't have a father, so it was Mary by herself. Right. Prophet Muhammad, you don't hear about his father. Many of these, even a woman that's seen giving birth in the last days where the devil is waiting to devour her child is a woman and she's by herself. God has to intervene and give her wings where she avoids the flood of the dragon. And the, man, and, the, and the dragon is trying to kill her male son. Right? And the minister said that the dragon is described as red. And he said that the red symbolizes the anger of this civilization at that male child. So they understand that they have to begin to start corrupting the minds of women because the prophecy says that out of your womb will come the children that will crush the head of Satan. It says that his heel will damage the head, bruise the head of Satan, meaning it will damage the, civil, the, 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 the ruling thought of this world. So they went to work and began to start operating on your mind. It's no coincidence that in this last day and during this time, now you have all these reality shows where women who are not even married are being given the sacred title of a wife. For some of the episodes that I watched of these reality shows with these women, I've never saw some of their children. There are more episodes of them throwing bottles and shoes at one another and talking about one another than their mothers. Right? And some of the sisters are saying that they didn't like how they were portrayed. They didn't do that. They said when they bring that stuff back to the editing table, this is what comes out. So if these sisters are saying that that's not all of their person that they show, why is it that the final cut only shows black women in that image? And then the thing, it doesn't stop just with black women. You see the mob wives. It's the same thing. Look in our lessons when it talks about the MGT. And it says that the training for all women, right? Women. It didn't say just for black women. Women and girls in North America. And look at our Honorable Mr. Louis Farrakhan several weeks ago. He said that the class should be what? All women can benefit from that. Because he sees that the attack is against all women. But especially you as a black woman. Is everybody all right? Yes, sir. But the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said that even though the women are by themselves, he said that God wants to use that experience or that circumstance to build greater faith in him. He said that when Hagar was running to and fro and she's the, she was the wife of Abraham, he said that God wanted her to have a faith, a relationship with him independent of Abraham. And that's the thing that as women, especially as women in general, but especially women who are raising these, these children by themselves, 
You have to have a relationship with God because God is going to be the ultimate person that's going to send whomever and whatever to help you in this situation. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. There is a, that pattern of women being alone with, with children is not by accident. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan said that there's a great significance to why that phenomenon exists in the scriptures. And that significance is tied directly to you all as black women. Directly to you all as black women. But who's going to teach us? Who's going to open a book and tell you that what you read about Hagar running back and forth looking for help is for you? Right. It's to teach you the lesson that if you steal yourself, you will find what you need right at your feet. If you look, stop looking to the hills for help. God send me a man. But work to have a relationship with the ultimate man, which is God himself, you will begin to start getting the answers. And as you submit to God, then he will send you himself in the form of a well-made man. Right? Right. Praise is due to Allah. Case in point. Why did God allow this condition to exist? These women being left alone with children. He allowed it to exist because he saw, as is written in the book of Malachi, that in the last days before that great and dreadful day, that I'm going to send Elijah. But it's interesting, the work of Elijah, Elijah comes to purify the gold and the silver. It says like he's, they say he's like a full of soap. And full of soap, full of soap is used to purify, to clean the wool on sheep. Meaning he comes, to con- he comes to clean a people who are like sheep. He's like a full of fire. He comes with such a uh, truth that has such an intense heat that if, if people take it in and practice it, it begins to burn off the dross that's on them. He purifies them, is that right? But then it says about Elijah, he's going to turn the hearts of the children back to the father. Well, wait, Elijah. Wait, God. If you have children, you have to have a mother. Why isn't Elijah dealing with the women as well? Why just the fathers? Elijah is dealing with the fathers and the children because this Elijah comes to a people where 90% of their communities are headed by women. Where the man is not physically there. If he's physically there, he's not spiritually there. So he understands he has to begin the process of atonement to turn the children's heart back to the father because there are many of them have issues with their fathers. You listen to the song that Jay-Z, Scarface, and Beanie Siegel's made where they're talking about how their relationship with their daddy wasn't the best. Where Jay-Z talks about where Beanie Siegel said he had nobody to teach him how to box or throw a ball back and forward. Do you think it is a coincidence that Jay-Z ended up getting married pretty not, not too long after he reconciled his relationship with his daddy? There are studies that show that if our relationships with our parents are not resolved or we don't go in to begin to start the process of healing, it affects our ability to select a mate, male or female. So this Elijah comes. Now look at the scriptures. He comes... And when he comes, he comes turning the hearts of the fathers back to the children and vice, for, vice versa. But then the next thing that, this, the, the thing that Elijah also does in the scripture, he's the first prophet to ever raise someone back from the dead. Before Jesus was even born. Elijah the prophet, and guess who he raised back from the dead? He raised the son of a widow. Think about that. He was sent to a widow who felt like she barely had enough to feed herself and her one child. And she was preparing with the little that she had. She was basically making her last meal. Where she was basically saying, I'm going to prepare this last meal for my son and we just going to go and die. Right? And she was a widow. Right? Then what's interesting, this Elijah had an assistant named Elisha. And he helped the widow out as well who was in a condition who had sons who felt that she didn't have enough to take care of her sons. Why is this happening over and over? Right? And Elijah even brought back, he was the second person to resurrect a male child from the grave. All of this is symbolic. 
The album Mr. Louis Farrakhan teaches that the Elijah and the, the widow that the Elijah and the Elisha dealt with are signs of the black woman here in America. Yes. What do we mean? Some of you all are physical widows, that you have really lost a husband or a boyfriend to death, to police brutality, to HIV, to drug abuse. You've really experienced that. But many of you are widows spiritually, emotionally, and mentally. Right? Where even though you have, you may have some male in your life, but it's just like you don't have one. Because the album Mr. Louis Farrakhan said that white supremacy has destroyed black men. So you can have a man in your life, a male in your life, but you can't extract from him what God has placed in him to give you comfort. Because the world has destroyed him. The world has him not seeing himself as he is. And if he can't see himself as he is, he cannot give to you what God has put in him to give to you to help you in your nature. Right? Now think about this. If you have a male in your life, but you tell your girlfriends about how he ain't nothing, girl, I don't believe nothing that he say. There are women who have males in their life where they say, we may be involved intimately, but they don't even trust us. Right. They don't even depend on us to help them. Right. So if you're in a relationship like that, you're a widow. Because you, a widow is a woman who has a dead spouse and a black man is dead. Right? And her sons have died. Who do you see crying outside of these police crime scenes? Mamas. Screaming. Fighting through the tape to let me touch my baby. Where are the fathers? They're losing their sons. And in the book of Exodus... It talks about how there was a genocidal plot that was executed to kill the male members. Right. See, we are thankful to have a teacher that has gotten us out of this spookism where we understand that these books are talking about right now. Man, let me get through this. So the Alam Elijah Muhammad and the Alam Minister Louis Farrakhan teach us that this Elijah and Elisha, or we know this Elijah is a sign of the Alam Elijah Muhammad. This Elisha is a sign of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And many of you all are either, some of you all may be Masons. Some of you all may be Eastern Stars, or you may know people who are part of the Masons. You see on the back of their car, they got the two compasses and the squares, and they had a letter G, right? You see them wear their stuff. But do you know in the, in the Mason Masonic lodges, in one of their rituals, a question is asked to them? And when somebody asks this them, when they, somebody comes to them and asks them this question, they are obligated to help. And the question is, who will help the widow's son? Mm. Now they go through the rituals, but the widow's son in, in masonry is said to be a brother by the name of Hiram and Abiff. And Hiram and Abiff is mentioned only one time in the Bible, and he was mentioned in the Bible that Solomon, who was a prophet of God, chose Hiram and Abiff to go and build a temple of God, not in the space, but on earth. Hiram was a master architect. There was nothing he couldn't build, right? But when Hiram was selected, there were 17 other uh, hoodlums around who got upset that this Hiram was chosen above them. So they began to begin into a plot to kill him. But out of that 17 or 15, three of them said, no, we're going to carry on the plot. Right. So they caught Hiram, this figure, and they killed him. Yes. Hit him in his head, hit him in his stroke, hit him in his chest, and they took him in, on an easterly course, and they buried him in a shallow grave. So people who are masons and eastern stars, they go through this ritual, but that ritual is really a fable or a symbolic story talking about what has happened to black people, but black men in particular. Hiram is a master architect. No other people are builders of the greatest civilization that the world knows except the black man and woman in, 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 on, the, on the planet Earth. That's true. That's true. White folks are traveling. They travel all from their, their Europe and China and every place to come to Africa to study our civilizations. That's right. They're finding civilizations buried under water. Right. 
They're finding that we knew how to repair broken bones. They're finding that we had a system where we can tell a woman just by testing her urine, not only that she was pregnant, but if she was having a boy or a girl. They're finding that we had the ability to perform what's known today as cesarean sections. They're finding that we had all type of medicine and science and mathematics. They came to get us in the White House in D.C., a black man by the name of Benjamin Banneker, he wasn't even a man hired to do the job. He was an assistant of the white boy, the French man. And the French dude got upset and he left. And they said, man, he took his blueprints. How will we know Benjamin Banneker, the man who created the first clock, he had a photographic memory. Just off of what he remembered about what the white man's plans were, he built it. We built the, pyramid, the pyramids, which is the only remaining wonder of the world that still exists. But it goes further than that. We are also uh, the builders of this very universe that we are in. So teaches the Mozambi Elijah Muhammad. So he teaches that we put the sun, the moon, the stars in the universe. We made sure that the water is on the earth that is balanced by mountains. We came, it came out of the mind of a black man that the sun would sit in the center of the universe and nine planets would revolve around it. And the planet, the universe, is only symbolically after the human body. Right? So we're that Hiram and Abiff, but we've been hit over our head. We've been buried in a shallow grave, and that grave is the grave of ignorance. We've been buried in a white man's society. We've taken in his ways, his mores, and his morals, and it has spiritually killed us and killing us. Is that right? Yes, sir. So Hiram need to be, guess what Hiram was in need of? He was in need of being resurrected. And they said the only person that could resurrect him was someone who had the lion's grip or the master's grip or the lion's paw. He was such in a condition that it couldn't, it took a special person to do it. So the Mozambi Elijah Muhammad said first, they found Hiram and they found him. When the guy tried to get him up, he grabbed his hand. He couldn't get him up. All the flesh came off of his hand. So then Solomon sent another one. He was able to pull Hiram out of the grave, stood him up. When he let him go, Hiram fell right back in the grave. Then the last one. God, Solomon said, forget about it, I'm coming myself. So the Mosaic Elijah Muhammad said at that first one in that Masonic ritual, and go home and just go home and Google the hiring of Biff and Masonry. And just read the ritual. And ask yourself, why are grown men participating in this ritual? There's a greater meaning to it. They don't know it. Right? He said the first one was Noble Drew Ali who came teaching us some semblance of Islam. But he couldn't get us out of the grave. Then the next one that came was Marcus Garvey. Marcus Garvey got us up. We began to start pooling our resources, talking about going back to Africa. But they set Marcus Garvey up and deported him from New Orleans where he went to his, back to his homeland and he died. And when Marcus Garvey's organization was broken up, we fell back in the grave. And as in that ritual, Solomon came. You break it down, solo man. Solo means one. One man came. And that one man, according to the Most High Elijah Muhammad, was God himself. He came with a master grip. A master came. And so the Most High Elijah Muhammad, when he sat with Master Farad Muhammad, or Farad Muhammad, the man that he knew, he said he was so taken back by him that he decided to call him Master Farad Muhammad. So he came with this lion, this lion grip, is that right? So God has already raised a helper for the widow and their son. It's the Ambil Elijah Muhammad and the Ambil Minister Louis Farrakhan. And they are already doing the work of resurrecting black men. See, the problem is Satan has given us a misunderstanding of this scripture that we are looking for a physical resurrection and you don't realize that you're seeing a resurrection in your midst when someone reaches you on the corner and asks you to, do you want to make a donation for this final call? When you meet your cousin, he used to be Roosevelt Jones, now he's Roosevelt X. Right? Vincent Walker, now he's Vincent X. And the X represents resurrection. 
That's what it means. I'm, I'm coming up. I'm being resurrected. Now I know I'm growing into knowledge of myself. Right. There's an article titled, The Nation of Islam Extends Its Reach Behind Prison Walls. Can I have a couple of more minutes? Yes. Listen to the article. It says, a lean, light-skinned black man sits upright on a metal folding chair, decked out in a press shirt, a cable-stitched sweater, and a bow tie. R. Khalil, hardly fits the image of an inmate housed here at a highly, a high-security security Maryland House of Corrections. Mr. Khalil wrote, whose rap sheet ranges from robbery to attempted murder, is aware of the contradictory picture he represents. He used to run with a tough crowd in Baltimore, Baltimore's blighted inner city where drug dealing and violence figured pro prominently in his past. A clean shaven and impeccable distinction in diction were foreign, right? Black men, this is the brother speaking, black men didn't have any images we could draw from. This is the brother saying about what he experienced. He goes, Khalil says, but while serving time for his first conviction, he learned about the Nation of Islam and its leader, Minister Louis Farrakhan. Yeah. The Nation of Islam made me feel like a person worth more than any, he said, the Nation of Islam made me feel like a person of worth more than any time in my life. Yes. Right? He says, Minister Farrakhan was the closest representation of manhood he had ever seen. Oh, wow. Right? So people laugh when they hear us being given a student enrollment and ask us the question, who is the original man? Right. But it's that one question is one of the things that begins to awaken us out of the grave. Right. When somebody tells us we are the first people on the planet Earth, right. God of the universe, right. the maker, the owner, cream of the planet Earth, right? It was that one sentence that awakened Tupac Shakur's mother. So people make mockery of a master teacher who can take a little sentence and begin to give us life. Yes, is that right? Yes, sir. Then when it goes, then here's another guy. This is a guy, he hates the Ahmed Elijah Muhammad, but he had to bear witness. Daniel Pipes, in his article, How Did Elijah Win? He says the following. Among non-Muslim blacks, the enviable reputation enjoyed by Islam is traceable in good part to the discipline it, it is thought to impose on young men, thereby addressing what may be the black community's number one problem. He's saying that the black community's number one problem, we lack discipline. Basically, he's saying we're savage. Yes. He goes further. A Baptist woman whose son converted expressed this favorable disposition. Listen to what she said. This Islam sounds like the true religion to me. They don't believe in smoking dope, drinking liquor, and no adultery. I said we could choose. I said we could use more teaching like that. When my son reached, when my son reached over to be a Muslim, I was not going to fault him. I enjoyed listening to him talk about it and how it came out of Africa, and it sounds pretty good. We have a track record of reforming brothers and sisters. And that's not even including the people who were touched by the minister's words that never joined the nation of Islam, but now they're better husbands. Better wives, better fathers, better daughters, better mothers, is that right? Yes, right? So, and for the widow's son today, turn your son over to the mind of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. Yes. Does that mean joining the nation? It could mean that. But let your children feed on the man's mind like this. Let your son see a man speaking bold like this. Let your son and your daughter see a man that's professing love for our people. Yes. Right. And all we have to do is step back because there's already a seed in them and he will give the water to grow that seed. Right? So the widow needed help as well. See, the widow needed to know that despite her situation, even though it seemed hopeless, that God had not forsaken her. You know that God had already had a plan. Here this lady in the Bible, in the book of Kings, she was wondering about being able to feed herself and her family, and she hadn't even known that God had already sent a prophet her way. But she was such in a bitter condition, she had lost faith in men so much that when the man of God came, she still doubted. Right? right? See, as a widow, sometimes, sisters, when you are by yourself, for the sake of just having some type of male companionship, you compromise your standards. 
just to have a male in your life. Because you feel if you don't want to go older, you don't want another year to pass where you don't have any male, a man in your life. So you lower your standards, and here come this person that makes you doubt yourself even more so. Who makes you not believe in yourself even more so because now you feel like, man, I made the same mistake again. I should have listened to myself and waited. You see the same smooth talker. And when they say something to you, you say, man, I heard this before, but it sounds so good. And you doubt yourself. And every time you fall for that trick, you believe lesser and lesser in yourself. So you can be around a teacher that hear you say this, but because of that urge is there, you will compromise. You'll use your, rea- you'll use your intelligence and your newfound knowledge to begin to justify doing what God has come to tell you this is the right thing for you to do. And if you hold faith, if you have faith in me, I will send you myself in the form of a well-made man. man. But I understand that there's more work for you to do. Because if I sent that well-made man to you now, you haven't got over your past hurt. And you will treat that well-made man like he was one of the niggas that hurt you before. Right? If you read in a book of Kings, both of the widows didn't think that they had enough. Right, listen. And all the prophet of God came, he kept reassuring them that, listen, you have enough, stop fretting, stop being afraid. Right. The scripture, God told Elijah, he said, I'm sending you to a widow who will feed you. Yes. But when he meets the woman, she'd act like God ain't never tell her anything. Yes. Soon as he asked her for water and bread, the first thing came out of her mouth is, I don't have that. Yeah. Because she was in a form spiritually where she had lost faith in men. She had lost faith in men. But the key aspect to this is this. The key aspect to both of those stories is that God wanted from the widows, what God wanted from the widows is their faith and trust in the man that he would send to the solutions to their problems. So for many of our sisters who are in these, they've had these relationships where they don't even believe in men. They all men are dogs, girl. All of them cheat. The first medicine that comes to you to get, begin to start repairing that mind is when somebody comes to tell you God is a man. That's the first medicine. Right. Now you have to go from all men being dogs they are going to always cheat to a man being divine. Now as you begin to start adjusting that and believing in that, because some sisters, because of what they've experienced in the world, it's hard for them to believe what the Amir Elijah Muhammad says about the reality of God. Because in the back of their mind, I mean, he might, if he's a man, then he have the same urges as other men. Does God do this? Does God do that? So they're like Sarah. They're like Sarah. They're behind the tent laughing at what God says about their future. So God comes and tells you that you're the queen of the planet Earth. They're back behind the tent laughing. Yeah, right. And God hears it all. But he doesn't get mad because he understands that your circumstance has affected your current mentality. Right. Is that right? So because their faith in men was eroded, she began to doubt the man of God that God has sent with her salvation. And that's the condition that we're in. So in order for them to have their, so their problem solved, guess what they had to do? They had to obey the man of God. The widow's son, even though she kept worrying about we don't have enough food, he said, go and get it. And when she submitted, understanding came, but also relief to her problem. Yes. That's right. So the solution to those widows who are spiritually and mentally widows, it starts with a lifestyle and a mindset of being obedient to God. Give your life over to God. If you're in the mosque or you're in the church, begin to start serving God sincerely. Yes. Right. But if you want an accelerated portion, hook your mind up to God's man in our midst that's in the person of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. I'm almost there. Man, I went too far. Oh, here's the Jesus connection. Because Jesus has a very great significance to us as well. We are the people that Jesus is going to be sent to and come from. It says that he needed a lion's. Why a lion's paw? Why a lion's grip? Why not a lamb? Why not an eagle? Isn't Jesus referred to as the lion of Judah? Yes. Right. 
And in masonry, they say that this is where the lion's grip come from out of that tradition because Jesus will come from the tribe of Judah. So he comes, these people are in need of the Messiah. They need a real teaching of the Messiah, not what their slave masters have taught them. God has raised the most honorable Elijah Muhammad and the honorable minister Louis Farrakhan who have the master grip that if we reach out and hold on to their hand, we can be pulled up out of the grave. Yes, right. We can be pulled up, not only pulled up out of the grave, we can be pulled up out of the grave and made masters. Yes, where we can be given force and power to master ourselves and those things that keep pulling us into this world. Yes, so I tell you, brothers and sisters, hearken, run to Listen to as much as you can the voice of the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan and watch the God in you comes, begins to be awakened. So I leave with the greeting words of peace and paradise. I salam alaikum. So with that being said, Brother, Brother Walter, I'll bring you and Brother Walter to do the announcements. Thank you all, brothers and sisters. And I leave with the greeting words of peace and paradise once again. I salam alaikum. Let's give our minister a strong round of applause.